Muy buenos días. A very good morning. We would like to thank you very much to the we would like to thank the journalists for being with us this morning. Microphone for the speaker. Como lo sabrán ustedes. As you are aware, as you may well have read in the international media, on the 3rd of August, the Republic of Equatorial Guinea marked 40 years since the Liberty Coup, which occurred on the 3rd of August, 1979. And this saw the current president of the Republic playing a key role. To mark this 40th anniversary as current president of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea, there were many press communiques issued. There was also a great deal of criticism. Most of this was negative and not constructive criticism. So I just wished to carry out an overview of what has been achieved over the last 40 years. Looking back at what Equatorial Guinea was like before the 3rd of August 1979, it was a country in which almost half of the population had left the country to go to other African countries and indeed to Europe, countries such as Spain. The administration back then was completely par paralyzed. There weren't hospitals or schools. And uh, many religious uh, centers, centers of worship, had also been closed down. And there was just simply a lack of production in the country. When we acceded to independence, on the 12th of October 1968, we produced uh, 50,000 uh, tons of cocoa. And by 1979, this amount of production had gone down substantially. And that is the reason why the government of, Republic, uh, of the Republic of Equatorial Guinea has issued a communique, which I will be reading out to you to look back at our history, and then we'll be able to answer any questions that you may have in this regard. So I will now read out the communique. And then I will also give you copies in Spanish or English as you prefer. Equatorial Guinea has just celebrated 40 years of peace, prosperity, and healthy national coexistence. The government of Equatorial Guinea refutes the article that was published by Amnesty International on the 2nd of August this year. In this regard, the government of Equatorial Guinea would like to underline that the Liberty Coup, which occurred on the 3rd of August 1979, happily modified the direction of our country's history. A wind of freedom and, above all, of hope rose in all cities, in all peoples, and in all homes, spreading the hope of a new life for all parts of the population, who prior to that had only known terror, intimid intimidation, and humiliation, and for whom freedom had remained an unattainable dream. After the liberation of the people and the country, the immediate objective was to begin a moral and mental rebuilding of Equatorial Guinea so as to build a new mindset in the country and to instill greater confidence that had lain dormant prior to that. In the medium term, the stated objective was to achieve the reconstruction of the country. To do this, it was necessary to forge a new Equatorial Guinea, through a restoration of its morality and renewed trust. And this would allow the projection of the country's socio-economic development. 
after the reconstruction phase, which, as I say, was both mental and moral in its nature, after that we began constructing our country in a wise and accelerated way. The reconstruction of the human capital necessary to achieve our socio-economic development required a great deal of time and sacrifice. His Excellency, the President of Yan Ngema Mbasogo, has masterfully directed the different stages of this process, and this so as to ensure that our country can truly emerge and to ensure the well-being of our population, and this with a coherent, harmonious, and participatory approach. This is to the credit of this towering figure, and this merit is recognized beyond our borders and our continent. Thus, following our accession to the CFA franc, which is the currency in the area, the holding of national economic conferences paved the way for the nation's sustainable development. The second national economic conference, with the adoption and implementation of the National Development Plan for 2020, was instrumental in this approach, which aimed to ensure the root and branch transformation of Equatorial Guinea. And similarly crucial was the human capital that had to be trained to support this development. There are numerous areas in the national territory which have seen radical changes. For instance, the widespread availability of electricity and drinking water has transformed the daily life of the homes of, equatorial, of people in Equatorial Guinea. Work to strengthen human capital has also multiplied with the construction and operationalization of schools, of training institutes and universities. And we've also seen the construction of hospitals and highly equipped health centers. These have all gone hand in hand with social housing programs that have been disseminated throughout all districts of our country. This has led to the building up of our residential areas, and all of this has respected rigorous planning. For instance, I could mention the construction of the urban districts, which is a true revolution in the territorial and administrative planning of our country. The infrastructure sector, sector has also experienced a genuine revolution with the construction of modern highways, numerous bridges, port and airport facilities that all meet the highest quality standards, and we continue to build today. All of these achievements have been due to the establishment of a climate of peace, respect for human rights, with the unequivocal quest for an increasingly solid national cohesion, thanks to the vision and, above all, to the unwavering determination of our leader, His Excellency Obiang Ngema Mbasogo. Peace, cohesion and national security, as well as the sense of a good job framed in a participatory and peaceful democracy, are translated into the daily invitation that the President extends to all citizens of Equatorial Guinea. The solid foundations of our young nation have also been recognized at the concert of nations of this globalized world, where our place, the place of this modern Equatorial Guinea, is recognized and even envied. Our country hosts the headquarters of the SEMAC Parliament. And we have also hosted various summits of heads of state at the African and global level. Our country also plays a recognized and valued role in prestigious international organizations, such as OPEC, the um, Francophonie, or the CPLP. At the UN, we would like to highlight our presidency of the UN Security Council earlier this year, which was a memorable period, 
and a presidency that culminated in the trip made by the President, His Excellency Obiang Basogo, to ensure that his voice would be broadcast at this August Council. The government underlines our solidarity that we have shown in responding to the various disasters in the continent, such as the financial support that we gave to the WHO during the terrible outbreak of uh, uh, Ebola and the FAO to address the urgent food security needs that arose in some countries in our continent. And indeed, we have also provided a great deal of other humanitarian support in other parts of the world. To this firm action, which has been recognized and appreciated throughout the world, we must also add the UNESCO Equatorial Guinea Prize, which is a source of pride for researchers in countries of the South. Today, we look to the future with many resources within our reach. We have celebrated with remarkable success our third National Economic Conference, which aims to broaden our national plan for economic and social development to 2035. The government continues to work with determination and intelligence to implement our new plan of development for the benefit of our brave people. It is imperative that we continue with this culture of peace and we must every day reinforce our national cohesion in a climate of security. This is the only guarantor of our sustainable development. This is precisely the essence and the struggle that President Obiang Ngemba Mbasogo has been fighting with determination from the very beginning. All the people of Equatorial Guinea are united. We know that we have a duty to support him and to be by his side in this road to success. We would like to point out that the fact that Amnesty International has published headlines such as, one, Equatorial Guinea, 40 years of repression and empire of fear, highlights the rights crisis of human rights. Two, People in Equatorial Guinea, which turns 40 this year, were born and raised in a country where human rights have been consistently and systematically violated. People have been in a climate of terror because of impunity for human rights abuses and violations. Three, tortured prisoners hung head down by their feet. Four, extrajudicial executions. Five, for decades, the repression of dissent by President Ngema has had a devastating and chilling effect on human rights defenders, journalists, and political activists. And so many other headlines uh, of this kind have occurred to them, all under the seal funding and direction of Mr. George Soros and his foundation, the Open Society Institute. We call him a criminal. It is known that George Soros is a billionaire, a financial speculator and a criminal with obvious geostrategic and imperialistic interests who has been dedicating his life to supporting imperialist movements and to expand capitalism by shedding blood in countless countries over very many decades. We would like to inform national and international public opinion that they should not be fooled or confused if philanthropic actions appear to be funded by this man and his foundation. We must be clear that to Soros, it's all the same to him whether he is financing civil rights movements or criminal movements, either through peaceful or through violent means, in order to destroy entire societies and nations. There are no shortage of examples. We cannot forget and should not forget that George Soros played a key role in the counter-revolutionary and anti-communist processes in Eastern Europe, especially between 1984 and 1989, supporting, for example, 
the anti-communist trade union movement Solidarity in Poland or supporting the Charter 77 in Czechoslovakia. Today, the world is witnessing the situation of countries like Libya and others. We know that Soros gave instructions on how to undermine the protests in Albania in 2011. Recently, Soros has acknowledged having funded the coup leaders in Ukraine in 2014, with all the atrocities that that supposed. Soros has intervened in the overthrow of former Brazilian President Dilma Rousseff, and he's no stranger to the war in Syria. The list of Soros's uh, destructive interventions in different countries is endless. All this so that it be known who George Soros is, how he works, and what he works for, always with the aim of expanding his negative influence at the cost of financing destabilization movements in different countries of the world. If in doing this, terrorism and jihadism have to be financed, he finances it. For him, the attacks promoted by terrorists and jihadists, no matter how heinous they may be, do not matter. The important thing is that he destroys the target, his targets and accumulates more wealth. Equatorial Guinea is united as a single man supporting our head of state, His Excellency Obiang Ngema Mbasogo. We will continue fighting to maintain peace, social balance, national cohesion, and a social order, a healthy social order, and be a guardian of law and equity, proving that the children of this nation cannot be moved around like pieces on a global chessboard where the criminal George Soros is playing the game. Is this el that is the content of the official communique of the government of Equatorial Guinea. We are now available for any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. Hi there. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for the briefing. Um, James Rinal with Middle East Eye. Um, uh, from the communique, can you just explain... Although there are strong criticisms levelled against George Soros, are you saying that he has directly funded Amnesty International and these other human rights groups which have criticised uh, the government in Equatorial Guinea? And as a second question, although I um, understand that much has changed in your country over the last 40 years, and there has been roads built and electricity rolled out, that most of the criticisms when it comes to development in your country, are that you have, thanks to the oil wealth, uh, high GDP cap per capita on a level with a country like Israel, and yet the social services in your country are at levels far below what one, what one would expect for a country of your wealth. And that when you look at, for example, some of the uh, corruption uh, cases that have been proven against the president's son, the yachts, the sports cars, etc., that the indication is that's where the money is going. Thank you very much. As we've already said, I think in a previous press conference that I had here, sometimes in the past, Amnesty International had attempted to work in Equatorial Guinea. And this was entailed costs that the government of Equatorial Guinea was not able to accept. And that has led, as you are aware, to criticism against the government of Equatorial Guinea. We saw what was published in France, for instance, in the criticism, and we denounced it then. After Equatorial Guinea acceded to independence, 
in the 10 years after that, we never heard Equatorial Guinea mentioned in the international press. But in that time, there was a great deal of suffering. Many people were dying, but the international press didn't pay any attention to the situation in Equatorial Guinea. It simply wasn't talked about in those years. Then, after 1979, when the president acceded to power and when the aim was to eradicate extreme poverty, then there was claims that the country had to be helped after so many years suffering. But it was then in the 1990s when oil was discovered. It was then that Equatorial Guinea was able to really fuel its development. And that has really been since then that Equatorial Guinea has been in the international press. And that is since then that the that Amnesty International has also been writing articles about Equatorial Guinea, but not prior to that. You mentioned the Vice President of the Republic. Is it really credible to say that he's the only one who is facing these kind of accusations? Why is it just countries such as ours that are receiving this, this kind of criticism and these complaints? We know that there are many other cases, but they're simply not talked about. And we're talking very often about leaders of governments, but they're simply never reported on. It's only African countries to whom one wants to point the finger. Before he became vice president, he, he was involved in economic activities, in fishery, uh, fisheries and forestry, and he was quite free to develop his own economic activities then, as many other people do in different countries. And of course, we are seeing that he is now being criticized for doing things that, quite frankly, many other people around the world could also be accused of. I think perhaps, well, if there's corruption in Equatorial Guinea, Equator uh, corruption exists throughout the world. Even in the most developed countries, there is corruption. So I think you have to understand that when oil was discovered in the 1990s, everything was still to be done. We had really to, to, to start from scratch. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have drinking water. We didn't have hospitals. We didn't have anything back then. To travel 50 kilometers by car, back then it took three hours to make that kind of journey, or even four hours. Just to travel 50 kilometers, that gives you an idea of how, what a poor state the roads were in back then. Of course, yes, resources from oil have been used to transform the country. We have seen significant investment made throughout the country. All of those who visit Equatorial Guinea always remark that the country is very different from how it is often reported in the international press. They come back from Equatorial Guinea with a completely different impression than what they had ha read about in the press. Because the press never photographs the recent development, for instance, the recent constructions, the 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 recent, uh, recently built neighborhoods. The press always tries to paint a very negative picture. And quite frankly, often there is a link to a need to or desire to stoke instability in the country. In 2017, there was an attempt by mercenaries to destabilize the country at the border with Cameroon, where the president was only 100 kilometers away. And you know very well about uh, the attempt made by Simon Mann, who traveled from South Africa and Zimbabwe. And there were many others. And this, of course, has all occurred after oil was discovered in Equatorial Guinea. Of course, the aim, after all, is to take ownership of these resources. 
But if you look at the situation in Africa today, if you look at the comparison with other countries, look at the state of development of infrastructure, of hospitals. Compare the situation in Equatorial Guinea to other countries, and then I think you'll understand what I'm saying. It's quite clear the extent to which we have been able to fuel our development. But unfortunately, Amnesty International doesn't want to talk about that. What's Mr. Soros's interest in Equatorial Guinea? Why is he behind all of these attempts? Why does he want to finance these attempts? In 2017, he was behind that attempt by the mercenaries to try and get a hold of the oil resources. And there's a, a, an, an island in the uh, Atlantic Ocean where there is the highest, uh, uh, the, the largest tuna resources in the Atlantic Ocean. So perhaps that was to do with his, uh, uh, something to do with his interests. We have a whole range of resources that can perhaps be rather uh, tempting to these kind of people to try and uh, wreak instability. So it's all linked to the res immense resources that we have. If you go to Equatorial Guinea, you'll see how we have invested the proceeds from our oil resources throughout the country, in all districts. Ambassador. Could you please identify yourself? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ambassador, you, you outlined some of the charges that Amnesty International made in their report. Um, you say you refute them, but can you give us a picture of what you see the human rights situation to be in Equatorial Guinea now? How would you say human rights, like, you know, are they respected? Are there arbitrary arrests? Are there, is there torture? Are there irregular trials? I mean, can you address these things and tell us that there are no problems with human rights in, in Equatorial Guinea? Well, I can't tell you that Equatorial Guinea is a perfect country. There's no perfect country in the world, and no human action is perfect. The only perfect human action is divine action. No country in the world is perfect. All countries have been accused of um, violating human rights, as far as I'm aware. All the countries that I'm familiar with. Um, I mean, what if a man goes to an area and attacks um, thieves? Mr. Okemvi, there was a report about this. Uh, he he had, uh, attacks robbers and uh, mistreats them. Now, when the police intervenes, rather than saying that the robbers uh, 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 attacked him, uh, he said, well, no, I was attacked by the authorities of Equatorial Guinea. That was the story. Um, now, a couple of years ago as well, after some elections, members of a party entered a military encampment of uh, 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 police and military to attack them, to uh, injure them, uh, and they left them half dead. Um, now, what are we supposed to do? Say, well, thank you, thank you for doing that. Uh, and they're not, are they not supposed to be put in prison and judged for that when they've done that kind of thing? I think all countries have to punish those kinds of actions. What can you do, for example, when, look at December 2017, there was an infiltration of a high number of weapons into the country um, we captured uh, a, a team around the border, and there were some others inside the, uh, our country working together with the uh, aggressive mercenaries. Now, what were, we, what were we supposed to do with those people? Not um, punish them for this? No, we had to call them to book for their attempt, their attempt to destabilize the government. Because you have to recognize one thing. When you have an aggression from um, outside your borders, you don't know who it's from. And they shoot at anybody, and they don't care who they're shooting at. They don't distinguish. We're seeing examples of this today. And so the question in our mind is, what does the community, international community want? 
Does the Security Council want to have even more on its agenda in terms of countries that are in crisis and to finance more peacekeeping missions? I think a few years ago, L Libya was not on the Security Council's agenda. A couple of years ago, Central Africa was. But, uh, was not, rather, but, but that now what's happened? Those countries ha uh, have entered on the uh, agenda of the Security Council because of things that have happened, and there have been thousands and thousands of deaths. We're seeing deaths. We're seeing this every day. Every day. This is what's happening on our continent, what's happening in the Sahel. After the terrorists um, became uh, fortified from the situation in Libya, what's the impact of that now on the Sahel? Children are not going to school. Women can't go to the fields uh, to work because the jihadists um, belonging to Boko Haram um, kidnap the, the, the women and the girls or just kill them. Why are those kinds of situations not being criticized? These are things that are persisting. So we have to be careful about what is coming into Equatorial Guinea. There's so many mistakes being made in the world today that I think what we need to do first and foremost is to avoid conflicts, to take preventive action and attempt to put an end to the current crises that we see in the world. So, to be specific, I didn't say here that Equatorial Guinea is a perfect country. There may be isolated cases, there may be individuals who have um, done wrong things and measures are being taken. We don't just let them get off the hook. The measures will be taken to address these things. But once again, we are not a perfect country. We're like any other country. The human rights situation in Equatorial Guinea is not very different to what it is in, in, in other countries of the region or even beyond the region. But why is it that we, we are being so attacked as a, as a, as a country. Uh, Equatorial Guinea is not going to allow itself to be called the worst of the worst. Thank you. As Europeans. Yes, the lady over there asked for the floor before. Gracias. Uh Thank you. I'm Lana from the Port uh, Luna news agency from Portugal. If Equatorial Guinea has a request for communities to be part of organizations such as the UN and the CPLP. How is that different from the other organizations? And is there any request to being made to those organizations from Ecuador Guinea? Do you mean a request to be a member? No. No, request to help the situation in Equatorial Guinea that you were talking about earlier, about the fear and the human rights situation. Well, as you know, Equatorial Guinea is a member of the CPLP. And we're also a member of the CEMAC and the of uh, ECAS. When it comes to the CPLP, well, Equatorial, Be Equatorial Guinea has been asked to abolish the death penalty. And indeed, we have established a moratorium on the death penalty, and the intention is to abolish the death penalty eventually. The Parliament is currently looking into that draft bill. The CPLP is also helping Equatorial Guinea to ensure that Portuguese can be spoken in schools in our country to facilitate communication. As you know, prior to the Spanish, it was Fernando Po, the Portuguese, who uh, discovered uh, uh, Equatorial Guinea prior to the uh, arrival, uh, arrival of the Spaniards. The Spaniards came far later to our region. So if you go to Bioko, the island and uh, uh, Sao Tome and Principe, 
there is, uh, of course, a, a great deal of link, uh, many links there, and Sao Tomé in Principe was a Portuguese colony. So, of course, we're also involved, uh, we also work with uh, Guinea-Bissau, Angola, other Portuguese-speaking countries, and this relates to all of our country's history. So we have a certain common destiny with these countries, and that is why we are working uh, with the CPLP, and they are helping us a great deal. In the UN, like all member states, there are uh, the UN, of course, has agencies and funds, and Equatorial Guinea is a member of most of these agencies, technical agencies and funds, such as the WHO, the FAO, such as UNESCO, for instance. So we participate in these bodies, and we work with them, as I have just mentioned in the communique, we donated $30 million to the FAO to help with the fight against uh, hunger and starvation. And indeed, we've also, we also gave $4 million to the WHO to the fight against Ebola when that w emerged in three countries in Africa. So, as I say, we are working actively with the United Nations. For instance, when the earthquake in Haiti happened, we donated money to OCHA, $3 million, to help with the recovery effort in Haiti. So this shows you what we've been doing. We've also benefited from these uh, agencies. In 1979, the UN helped our country a great deal, the UNDP, for instance, and the World Food Programme, the FAO, UNICEF, they've all provided a great deal of help to us, for instance, in our vaccinations program, in our education system. We have received a great deal of assistance from these agencies, and also the Bretton Woods institutions, the World Bank, for instance, we've also, been working, we've also worked with them, and the African Development Bank. We, as I say, are working actively with all sub-regional, regional, and international bodies. For example, the headquarters of the United Nations in Malabo, that was built by the government and uh, fully equipped by the government and was donated to the United Nations when the outgoing Secretary General Ban Ki-moon participated in the African summit in Malabo. He received that uh, building officially that uh, was furnished by uh, the government and which hosts uh, all UN activities in Equatorial Guinea today. Yeah. Uh, hi. Um, I just wanted to know, you, you referred to international journalists. Uh, how many uh, visas did you grant to international journalists in the last year or so? And, and who are you referring to uh, when you talk about international journalists and their coverage of your country? And also, uh, if uh, uh, you, I'm understanding it correctly, you're linking George Soros directly to the Amnesty International report or... Uh, what is what is the link you're making there um, clearly? Thanks. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Visas, well, no American needs a visa to enter Equatorial Guinea. No Tunisian needs a visa. It's visa-free, so any North American that wants to come to our country has access to the country. We've had uh, held major events of the African Union, international events such as uh, the African Cup. A lot of journalists went to that, and Spanish journalists in particular. And all journalists that wanted to visit these events have done so. Like any country in the world, if you want to travel to Equatorial Guinea, you need to uh, go through a procedure to obtain a visa, and uh, all of our embassies grant these visas, provided that the conditions and the aims of the uh, visit are, are clear. Is it tourism? Are you visiting family? Then visas are granted. 
there's no barrier in this regard. With regard to Amnesty International and Mr. Soros, well, we do link the two together, because when you look at what happened in, in 2017, we saw uh, a, an exacerbation of Amnesty International's criticism leveled against our country, as is happening now during the 40th anniversary of our um, freedom revolution. Um, we've seen this happen in the past. Um, in pe previous uh, periods of instability, or when there's been a mercenary invasion, or when there's been an attempted coup in our country, the, the two things are always uh, linked. And then when investigations are, are carried out, Mr. Soros's name always crops up with these kinds of events. And when these events do occur, we do investigate, and then that's when we discover the links that exist with regard to these actions that have taken place. Can I just ask one follow-up? Why, why is the United States one of the few countries you grant uh, visas to uh, its citizens automatically? After the United States, uh, Tunisia requested, we, we, grant, we did the same thing. We did the same thing, and I think even now we, uh, we, the, there are some other countries now in process of also uh, uh, eliminating the, the visa system. Let me tell you that we have a very uh, strong economic cooperation with the United States with the, with, with the oil production. We have a lot of investment of uh, American uh, enterprises in Equatorial Guinea. Programs of uh, elimination of malaria is carried out by oil companies in, in, in my country. There are a lot, a lot of, a lot of companies. But I think that if we, the country was so bad, as you were saying, this, this, con this company was not going to be, to be there. Why only Amnesty and certain people and journals are, are uh, in, in issuing such type of criticism? We don't understand. No lo entendemos. We just don't understand this. As in the case of the vice uh, president, if you go to Paris and London, you'll see yachts, big hotels, with foreign investment. Nobody talks about it. Because it's only the African leaders that seem to be the target of all of this criticism of ill-acquired goods. Yes, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for this press briefing. My name is Abadi. I'm from the paper Le Dossier. There is a dichotomy here. On one hand, you describe the coup of 79 as a liberty coup, while others talk about the establishment of dictatorship. Others describe the situation, social situation, freedom situation, humanitarian situation as dire in the country, and you, you do otherwise. Is there a misunderstanding about your country? And if that's the case, what is the government doing to redress the situation? Uh, Thank you very much for that question. That depends on everyone's interests. There are some countries that in their relations with African countries and those African countries that possess resources, they are used to their companies carrying out all the construction and infrastructure investment. But in the case of Equatorial Guinea, we have international tender which takes place. So if you look at the major works, construction works in Equatorial Guinea, you might come across a Spanish company, a US company, a Moroccan business, a Chinese company, a Japanese company. So all businesses, and some, some countries don't like that. A business that, for instance, wants to make a major investment and loses the competition, well, then that may lead them to criticize the country because they're rather bitter about what's happened. But we don't really understand that. We want to be transparent in the uh, tender process and uh, some countries that don't uh, win out 
if they haven't been able to obtain their interests, then that can lead to criticism being leveled. Our head of state has administered the resources so as to develop the country, and this throughout the national territory. You can see it for yourself. Anyone who goes to Bata, Malabo, Nabon, Curisco, throughout the country, you can see the extent to which our infrastructure has been developed. We have one of the best levels of infrastructure in Africa, hospitals, schools, universities. Today, in fact, we are there is the organization of a university, a new university in Oyala with uh, students not just from Equatorial Guinea but from the entire region. And agreements have been signed with different American and Spanish universities. So, really, it's a question of interests, the interests that one has. It's in some people's interests to try and project a very negative picture of Equatorial Guinea as a country and its leaders, to then try to justify destabilizing actions later on. And that is why I wanted to take this opportunity to denounce this on the international stage. After the failure of the attack of 2017, there are still other attempted destabilizing acts being planned. We have information about ongoing activities to try and destabilize our country, to try and perpetrate another coup d'etat. We understand that, there is, that this is being planned. And what's the reason? To try and get hold of the resources, the oil resources that haven't yet been used, to try and get hold of gas, forestry resources and uh, fish fisheries as well. But this is something that belongs to the people of Equatorial Guinea. Those who want to do this want to impose a president who will then do what they want so that they can exploit the resources as they want, as they please. And they don't want to have a president who is as transparent as ours, who attempts to administrate resources with this transparent international process with all countries of the world. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, good morning. Thank you, Ambassador. I have a question. What specifically is your country's government doing to invest in the young people of Equatorial Guinea to make sure that they got a good job opportunities, educational opportunities, and also, what is your country doing to empower women in terms of uh, making sure they have gender parity and equal opportunities in your government? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, in 1979, after the 3rd of August, we didn't even have 10 doctors in the whole country. Not even 10. There were no teachers. The first thing that the government did in the phase of national reconstruction was to train a lot of young people at all universities throughout the world, here in the US, in China, in Japan, in Russia. Throughout the world, you have students from Equatorial Guinea, and a lot of them have come home. Within the country, we have created two universities the National University of Equatorial Guinea and the Afro-American um, uh, uh, University. And this is all happening after the Third Economic Conference uh, in particular. That's when we uh, diversified economically in terms of production, the production sector, the tourism sector, and also the fisheries sector, agriculture. As I said, tourism, so that... Uh, young people could have the opportunity for employment. So we are finding a lot of young people jobs there. Um, a lot is said about generational change in the country. Uh, we need to give young people the opportunity to then move from those other jobs into posts of responsibility. And that sort of thing is on the increase. With regard to women, 
There are various uh, NGOs. The, we have the Ministry for the Promotion of Women. That's a very active ministry that is working on uh, gender equality. Uh, and also we have many projects supporting women. And in our parliament today, the president of the Senate is a woman. The vice president of the parliament is a woman. We have various ambassadors who are women. Our ambassador in Madrid, in Tunisia, in Italy, they're all women. And others, in, we have very many women in the government. That number's going up all the time. So the government is very aware of the, 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 the important role that women should play in society, in economic activities, and also at the heart of the decision-making power of the government. Well, once again, I would like to thank you for coming to the press conference. I, I know that you may have had other things... Uh, to do, but you decided to come to this press conference. I'm very grateful for that. And once again, let me repeat, our country is not perfect, but we cooperate with all countries in the world to receive uh, assistance, uh, support, to work together with all countries of the world. Our country is not as people are painting it and as those that have um, different interests are painting us. It's completely different to that. We should probably show you a DVD of uh, what our country is like, and then you can see exactly how we are developing Equatorial Guinea. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much.